Okay, hi everyone. Many thanks for joining us this evening. Um, I'd just like to warn you that my cat has decided that this exact moment is the perfect moment to jump in and start messing with my screen. You may see him, you may not. I'm Jonathan Ferguson. I'm Keeper of Firearms and Artillery at the Royal Armouries Museum. I'm extremely proud to, to welcome tonight Larry Zanoff, uh, motion picture armourer, um, who works for uh, Independent Studio Services over in LA, which is where he is at the moment, uh, thanks to the, the magic of the internet and one of the few silver linings of this um, terrible situation that we find ourselves in is that he's able to, to join us uh, tonight for a chat, which is wonderful. Um, he's also co-host of the excellent TV show, um, Hollywood Weapons, uh, Fact or Fiction, which I recommend you seek out. Um, his, his CV, uh, resume, wherever you are in the world, is seriously impressive. Have a look on IMDb. <laughs> uh, numerous favorites of mine on there. Um, <laughs> including Collateral, uh, Captain America, Winter Soldier, uh, the TV show Westworld. Um, he's, he's worked on video games as well, including the Call of Duty series. And has even appeared on camera, which we're gonna, we're gonna touch in a minute. Um, I'll ask you to unmute yourself, Larry. Um, and we'll- There we go, how's that? Can you hear me now? Oh, we can, yeah, and we can see you yeah. as well. How, how are things, how are you doing? Well, I don't know. I mean, after that intro, I don't know that I can live up to that kind of uh, <laughs> intro, but I'm doing well, uh, thank Good. goodness. And uh, everybody's healthy. And that's the main thing, especially in these crazy times. So I hope that's the same for you guys over at the armories. I know things have been difficult, but uh, let's just uh, pretend that we believe that better times are ahead. I like that. Yeah. Uh, what's the Blackadder quote? If, if all else fails of pig-headed unwillingness to look facts in the face, we'll see us through. There you go. And that way, <laughs> that way, at least we're covered. You know, if it gets better, we knew it was going to get better. If it doesn't, yeah. why then, you know, we were making light of it anyway. So yeah. thank well, you very much for having me on here, by the way. It's a great uh, thrill and honor to be doing this with you guys. You're, really, you're very welcome. Um, couldn't think of anything I'd rather do uh, this evening than talk to you. So, <laughs> um, you one, more, one more piece of housekeeping, um, if you don't mind, as, as we tend to call it. Uh, I need to let you know, oh, not you specifically, but I need to let the viewers know about our membership scheme that, that we have now. Um, and also that we're grateful for any donations, especially in the aforementioned difficult times uh, that, that we find ourselves in. So there'll be links in the chat to those two things. We've had a, a great response in this short series that we've been doing. Uh, to both of those, I gather. So um, enough enough of, of that chat. Just um, so you know, by the way, Jonathan, membership plan sounds much better than scheme. Somehow membership <laughs> scheme sounds, I don't know. Scheme. It just sounds just, a, yeah, exactly. It sounds just a little <laughs> bit iffy, so. Yeah, well, it's it's that, that's a project alongside my my weather machine and my volcano there. Uh -huh. so, yeah, no, I have nothing to do with these, these programs. <laughs> <laughs> Right, so uh, we, we, you have very kindly provided uh, some, some holiday snaps, uh, which, which we're gonna throw, I'm gonna throw on the screen while we're talking. Okay. And uh, the, the first one I just thought I'd, I'd, I'd stick up because um, it's just cool, uh, is hopefully everyone can see this. <laughs> Aha. Uh, that, was, that, was bar that was barbecue night. <laughs> um, <laughs> clearly that that's that's the barrel cluster of a m134 minigun um really? glowing quite red uh that was one of four miniguns actually that we had at i want to say it was the 2016 or 2017 shot show and we did a demo where each one of them did a 1500 round non-stop burst so wow. there you go that's what happens to the barrels uh and of course it, it happened to be nice and kind of smoky and at night and everything so uh the glowing barrels really did stand out but that was that was pretty cool it's really cool um i, I would hope that's your phone wallpaper <laughs> Uh, no, but I have a six foot by four foot enlarged poster of it behind my bed. So when I lay down nice. at night, I can look up at it and, you know, my, my wife doesn't like it, but, <laughs> but I think it's pretty cool. And I had it made up on that acrylic 
Have you ever done that? So it's the clear plastic acrylic with the no. backing of the photograph. So it, it, it glints at you sometimes. It's pretty cool. Oh, that is very cool. I'm now very jealous. Uh, so I was actually going to ask you something myself uh, uh, just before we move on on this so you, you've answered the question already this was live fire not not blank this was live fire in fact uh to the left uh of frame just outside of frame uh there was a winnebago a little camper uh full of some explosive materials actually of course and, there was. Uh, <laughs> part of the it was kind of the kickoff to one of the uh shot show after parties and uh, we had four of our armors out there. And we were all firing at the same time. As I'm sure you know, uh, miniguns are like thoroughbred horses. On the day, they can be really amazing, but they can also be very finicky sometimes. So uh, we were really proud. We had four guns up and running. They all ran flawlessly, not a single malfunction. And I think the crowd that was there was uh, very pleased with the results. And I got this great photograph, you know, as a memorabilia, which is, yeah. I think, great. Well, that that was just a taster, really. Let's. Uh, so, so your your job takes you all over the world in, in normal circumstances. It um, does. Tell, tell us about this. This is Morocco, I believe you said. Yeah, I mean, uh, you said holiday photos, and I was thinking of something with more pleasurable memories. Uh, <laughs> but this this indeed was uh, a Morocco. Um, it was a very interesting project, but it was a very challenging project as well. Um, we, and when I say we, I'm referring uh, myself is there. And then you can see Adam and Dan, who are two armorers uh, from our daughter company in the UK, which is known as Cohort Film Services. And then the gentleman on the far left uh, is Dan Riker, who's another armor that I bought from the United States with me. Everyone else there are members of the Moroccan military um, because uh, they are very tight as far as firearms control in Morocco. They don't uh, let anybody have guns, even armors that are coming from uh, outside of the country to film. We have to liaison with the military and they hold hmm. our firearms and we sign them in and out. Um, so there was some language barriers there. I speak a little bit of Arabic, but not enough to uh, keep up with, with those guys. There's some local dialects that is a little weird. Uh, in fact, uh, that photograph that you're looking at is a deserted village that we were filming in. Uh, and our journey on this film started in Casablanca because we had to fly in for a government weapons inspection. But then wow. when we got through with that, we had to drive 10 and a half hours out into the middle of the Sahara Desert. This is a little, little township called Erfoud, Morocco. Um, if you look up the definition in the dictionary of middle of nowhere, the middle of the Sahara Erfoud Desert. is in the this middle is... of the middle of nowhere. <laughs> um, but... Oddly enough, quite a few films, uh, including James Bond films, have been filmed there. And there's a specific um, geological uh, makeup of the sand, of the dirt. There's a, an area of dunes just to the south of where this photo was taken that NASA actually uses as a test bed for vehicles when they send things to Mars because the... Wow. the you know, the, the topography is so barren and so uh, totally unworldly um, that they, they test little rovers and things like that there. So we, we picked up um, a, a gun order at, at Cohort. I flew into London uh, for that. Uh, one of the highlights of that part of the trip, of course, was being able to come out and see uh, the Royal Armories in Leeds. And if people are watching and you've never seen the armories at Leeds, uh, I recommend it wholeheartedly that you go because it's uh, an amazing experience. Um, picked up the guns there, uh, flew out to Casablanca, did the inspection, and then me and our crew there, we, we spent 29 days out in the middle of the air food desert there where the average temperature was about 127 degrees every day. Yikes. Uh, by about 9, 30, 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, wow. But I will tell you that um, if you ever saw the movie, it was called 
Billy Lynn's Long Halftime Walk. It was a Ang Lee film, not really a war movie, but there were some flashbacks in it. Okay. And uh, if you watch that scene, it's, it's one of the, uh, the proudest moments of my career when I watch that scene because it's all about this one particular little event uh, in a battle, supposedly in Iraq, but we of course filmed it in Morocco. And when I watch that film, every time I watch it, I'm like, this is exactly what combat is like. It, it's right. as close as I've ever gotten. I mean, the, the acting crew was phenomenal, uh, including Ang Lee's uh, son. He played one of the parts. We spent two or three weeks in Georgia uh, in the United States doing a boot camp for these guys. So they learned mm -hmm. all the immediate action drills. They were doing their own magazine changes on camera and everything. Um, so they did, they did us proud and, and it looked really, really amazing. So uh, kind of an interesting film. Also um, the first film that utilized a new camera technology. It was like 4K and... 3D and certain number of frames per minute. I'm I'm not a camera tech, but sure. uh, it was basically the whole film was an experiment uh, using this new Sony camera. And when you watch the film, it it is pretty impressive. You should see it in IMAX, uh, by the way, for the best results. But, okay. Uh, yeah, this was this well, was I, Morocco. I should see it at all. Um, I, I'm ashamed to say I haven't seen it, but I will I will now have to check it out. Okay. Uh, um, There'll be a test on it later, Jonathan. So yeah. uh, make sure you pay attention, especially to the battle scene that was filmed in Morocco. Well, exactly. Any any time um, you in particular uh, say that a, that a scene is particularly realistic or well filmed, or I've got, I've got to compulsively go and check oh. that out because I oh, know okay. I know there's going to be a reason why you said that. I'm, um, I'm you, flattered by that. Up. Thank you. <laughs> no, it's true. Um, something I was going to to, to mention at some point um, that you've touched on already is the boot camp thing so yes. of the many things that you do in your um very sort of unsung role that you do a great job of shedding some light on whenever you're interviewed or appear on things um one of those roles is delivering some level of training or familiarization for actors extras people like that is that that's right i mean you don't you wouldn't do all of it necessarily but well you know it, it's it's one of those things that any television show or film production is really a collaborative effort between mm. an, an enormous crew uh, of people. And p different people have different jobs. I would be the on-set armor. There might be someone else whose job is to be the technical advisor, let's say. Um, the problem is, is that the technical advisors, we, we might have them at the boot camp, but the production may decide to not take them to Morocco. Often they do, but it's not a guaranteed thing. And so, uh, and, and the training sometimes gets done separate before the armor even shows up. Like they'll take yeah. actors out someplace else and get different guns and do training. And then three months later, you're out on set with an armor who brings different guns. So there's, there's a lot of dynamic change going on there. Um, but the end result is that the onset armorer is the last person handing off a firearm to the actor, right? We're the ones, we're yep. standing right there. We're, you know, if you're watching the movie and you see the frame, we are just outside of frame, you yeah. know, basically arm's length so we can step in if we see uh, a safety concern. And so a lot of times, even if there is a technical advisor who we frequently work with, um, it may still come down to the armor on set telling the actor, okay, you did this, you trained and that's all great, but technical advisor isn't here right now, I'm here. And so you're going to be doing what I tell you to do. Sure, and that sure. way we'll get through it safely. And, and, you know, the scene will look good. The actors will look good. And most importantly, nobody will get hurt. Um, yeah. So in that context, yes, we, we are very instrumental in putting on uh, different boot camps uh, because of legalities. You know, one thing we'll probably get into more a little later on, but these are real guns. They are, they are licensed, serialized, real firearms that we have converted to yeah. utilize blanks for television and film production. So it's not a fake gun. It's not a make-believe gun. It's not a prop gun. And so the armor always needs to be there just because of the legalities 
we're accountable for those firearms. Sure. Since we have to be there anyway and the production has to pay us, we take on the part of a safety officer. We take the part of a training officer, sometimes a technical advisor. Um, how, many, how many times you've seen a film, Jonathan, where there's a cleaning scene in yeah. the film? You know, the technical advisor might be able to teach the actor, actor tactical movement, but that technical advisor doesn't know how to take the gun apart. So then you have the armorer with the actor training them how to assemble and disassemble, make it look like when they're cleaning the gun, it looks, you know, like they know what they're doing because that's, yep. that's pretty much the key. Actors, you can tell. <laughs> yeah, you know, actors, a, a good actor, um, their, their magic, their skill is mimicry. If you show them how to do something correctly the first time, they are able to very rapidly pick that up and then it looks on, on screen like, like, yeah, this guy's a 40 year veteran of the FBI. He knows what he's doing or she knows what she's doing. And, and that's part of the magic of, again, that collaborative effort when, when everybody comes together. Yeah, it, it's, it's such a, it's a fascinating aspect of, of filmmaking and increasingly important and increasingly appreciated by the audience, I think. And it, and it makes older films look bad, unfortunately. So, same for sound effects, you know, uh, selection of things, which we'll get into later. The standards are, are just going up all the time, yeah. speaking as a consumer, you know. I, I think the education level of the viewing public uh, for a variety of reasons that we'll probably get into later as well. Uh, the education level about firearms, about tactical movements, you know, today's generation not only plays Call of Duty, but they've also watched CNN and seen conflicts all over mm -hmm. the world with soldiers in uniform and how they move and everything. And I, and I think it might not be correct to say that the, the level of education has gone up because it's actually fairly cyclic. If you go back and you look at movies like Battleground, which yeah. was a 1940s movie, even though the filming technology wasn't great, when you see the guys in the Battle of the Bulge setting up a 30 caliber machine gun, you look at it and you go, wow, they, they really look like they knew what they were doing. They must have had a good technical advisor. Well, they didn't have a technical advisor back then. They looked like they know what they were doing because the film was a 1949 movie and four years earlier, they were in World War II yep. doing that for real. Um, and we're seeing that now, technical advisors, extras, stuntmen, they're getting into the film business now are actually veterans who have come out of the last you know, two decades of fighting uh, uh, the war, war on terror and different conflicts around the world. And so again, it, it's a little bit more cyclic. It's not always a constant uh, upgrading. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right about that. Um, and it, you see where, where things start to dip down, um, where, where there's been a lot of peace, which is, which is you know, a good thing, but uh, it does tend to detract somewhat from, from the feel of, although you know, you know, the very similitude, if, if that's the right word. Um, of a of a film or or whatever, uh, so that's that's very interesting. Um, so the, the job is quite physical, quite strenuous. You're you're not just traveling around. You're you're lifting, carrying, doing all sorts of things. So tell us about about this interesting picture. Well, you really picked some good ones, didn't you? Um, so this was was a. Physically, as you put it, this is a physically very challenging film. Uh, clearly, we've got a, a multi-barrel Gatling gun, a Western hand-cranked kind of firearm there. Uh, just out of frame to the left uh, is the other end of this crow's nest, because this is like the crow's nest on an ironclad. And there's another Gatling gun on the other side. And they each weigh about 342 pounds a piece. Um, that crow's nest right there is about 60 feet up in the air uh, on a set that was built to look like an, a Civil War ironclad. And me and one of my other armorers uh, on a daily basis, we had to hoist these Gatling guns up into the crow's nest and then take them down at the end of the day. And then the next day, hoist them up there again. And it, it was... Um, 
very complex technical operation with a cherry picker where we had to kind of boom out. And because of the nature of the set, uh, we were about six and a half feet short. So at full boom extension, we couldn't quite reach um, the crow's nest. And so we had to set up kind of a sling system and I was in the crow's nest and I would sling the gun across to my partner who was up on, on the catwalk there. And then we would mount uh, the Gatling guns up there. Uh, so yeah, it, it's a technical job. It's a physical job. Uh, sometimes due to what needs to be done with the gun, the armorers do it. Sometimes it's because of legalities. We are the only ones allowed to do it. Like I couldn't give that to the cherry picker operator and say, just put it up there yourself. He's not licensed. Sure. So it's me and a crew of guys. And, and when we calculate out and we quote jobs, um, the type of the work is what we take into consideration. And, and the good example of this is on this, I had three guys helping get stuff put up and, and torn down each day. Um, you could show up to set with 12 M4s and, you know, if you're a good armor, you can, and they're kind of concentrated, you can take care of 12 guys by yourself, loading them up and clearing the guns each time. Um, and I had, as an example, I had a job where I had to do that. It was a busy night for one guy, but I got 12 uh, guys taken care of. And I went over to the first AD at the end of the night and said, hey, that was a little bit challenging. I don't like you guys having to wait. So tomorrow night, if it's the same kind of thing, tell me and I'll bring an additional armorer with me. And he went, oh, no, no, tomorrow night's going to be a piece of cake. There's only two people shooting, not 12 people. And I went, oh, OK, took him at face value. <laughs> uh, but the next night when I got out there, there, there were only two people shooting, but one of them was on a street corner and one of them was on a rooftop. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, I, I can't, I need another armor. And they're like, well, you took care of 12 guys yesterday by yourself. Why can't you take care of two guys now? It's like, well, because I can't be up on the roof and down on the ground at the same time. And both for legality reasons, but more importantly, for safety reasons. And yeah. so that's where you wind up giving one actor, you know, up on the, the roof, the guy has a rubber gun and you're down with the gunfire on the street and then they cut and then we swap and then you run up onto the roof and you're up there with the actor with that gunfire and down on the street, the actor has a rubber gun. Um, so you have to be, you know, yes, it's physically challenged. It's, it's very mentally challenging. You have to be on your feet all the time. Uh, you, you, can never say no. <laughs> you have to be able to say, no, we can't do that, but here's an alternate way of doing it. You right. know, solutions um, not problems. Yeah, so it, it, it is. And that one was a particularly challenging one. But again, uh, you know, those harder jobs, once they're done, they're kind of the ones that you wind up being most proud of. You go like, wow, that was, I mean, look what we did. We had Gatling guns up there and we did it, you know, for like a week and a half in a row, putting them up, taking them down. This, this by the way, was filmed in the bayou in Louisiana. So the humidity was like 96% every day. Temperature was like 85 to 90% every day. The insects were like ginormous, you know. So just <laughs> physically being out on set like that, uh, much less the worry about safety and the technical part of keeping the guns running and not rusting, for example. Rust was a, was a huge problem for us uh, with that humidity factor. Uh, but when you get through with it, you look back on it and, and go, wow, that was quite an achievement. They, they, they're always more fun to look back on. You know, when it's happening, it's not always that great, but, you know. Yeah, I've had a few projects like that, but probably nothing sure. as uh, taxing as what you've had to deal with. But yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I should say, by the way, uh, people watching, um, we're not, we won't handle questions too much throughout, but we are going to have a, some time at the end to cover questions from people who are watching. So please do submit, oh, cool. uh, submit those and, and Larry will do his best uh, once I finish rambling. So... Now, so 
that all sounds quite you know strenuous and difficult that's a is this the is this one of the perks is, is being on camera uh a good thing or is this just another part of the job that you you maybe rather not do you know it it just becomes <laughs> part of the job um you know the, the the photograph on the right clearly i'm in the um starboard uh gunner's position door gunner on, on a huey um when you're the armor and you get out on a job like that and you know a lot of stuff is done kind of not for real like you might have a helicopter in front of a green screen mm. and they're not really flying but the viewing public thinks that the helicopter's in the air and that that it's flying but it might be in front of a green screen but there are filmmakers who um for a variety of reasons for adrenaline levels for visual effects for the visual look of the actor's face when they're doing it they like to do things for real uh, it's challenging it's fun it, it elevates the level of the whole film and so you get out onto set where maybe the plan was this helicopter was always going to be attached to a crane in front of a green screen and now all of a sudden they're saying Oh, no, 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 no. We want the helicopter flying and flying for real. Uh, that's what happened in this particular instance. And my, my initial response was I had two initial issues with this. One was that initially it was never supposed to be flying. And the director wanted to see the brass casings and the links coming out of the gun as we fired it. Of course they did, yeah. Because it's, well, come on, it's dramatic. It looks cool, especially in a slow motion kind of thing. And that's what we were set up for. Well, once you are now flying for real, you can't have the brass and the links just dumping out the side. It actually becomes a safety issue where if the links and the brass hit the tail rotor of the bird, you could knock the helicopter out of the sky. Not, not something you really want to do. And so... You can see here on, on the right side of the gun, but you know to the left of it as you're looking at it, that mm. big kind of canvas looking thing, that is a brass catcher set up. And I, we, we didn't have it on hand because we were not prepared for that. We were told sure. the helicopter's never gonna fly. And of course this was filmed in Hawaii. So it wasn't like I could just run back to the shop and get it that night uh, at wrap. So we overnighted it. We had a courier send stuff out and we erected this brass catcher set up uh, on the gun. And then the second problem that I had was the legality. I can't let an unlicensed person just take my helicopter or take my machine gun in their helicopter and fly away with it. it the ATF that governs this kind of thing would consider that most definitely not in my control. Um, and so what happens quite frequently is the armorer becomes the guy on screen, on camera, who's doing the gunfire. And then later on, they might digitally erase his or her face. Um, so it's fun. I mean, <clears throat> we'll probably get, <clears throat> excuse me, we'll probably get into this a little bit later. But I mean, I've been in helicopters before. They're kind of fun to fly in. Um, so, you know, I don't mind it that much, but it just, it becomes part of, of the job. Um, yeah. and again, you know, it, it's, it is at the end, it's a nice story to tell and it's kind of fun and cool and, uh, it, it makes things look good on, on screen. It definitely did. Uh, so how was the lead? Um, I understand he was, he was a big guy, a bit of a mean temper. So that, that particular <laughs> movie um, had a, a very kind of large ensemble cast. Uh, so there really wasn't one lead. There was multiple well-known stars. Uh, in right, that, that, was a, that was a terrible, a terrible monster uh, reference. It was so, so terrible you didn't, you didn't oh, get Oh, I it. see. <laughs> oh, you were being funny. I, oh, well, I, I wasn't. It. I clearly you made, a mon you made a monkey out of me. Is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> out of myself, I think. Yeah, more than else. <laughs> um, yeah I guess I, I'll have to tune in better to your sense of humor. That was a little bit difficult because being that it was a CG mm. uh, lead, if you will, who was supposed to be 80 feet tall and everything, 
um, you're basically flying around shooting at nothing mm. because he's not really there. It, it's something that's going to happen later on with visual effects. And so even stuff like that becomes challenging to coordinate the flight of the, the aircraft and what you're pointing at and where you're shooting uh, and stuff like that. So uh, yeah. but it, was, it, was, it was a fun project. No, I, I, I really enjoyed the movie and, and the guns. Um, cool. And luckily you told me that you were going to be uh, visible, so I was able to keep an eye out. <laughs> I did spot you, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and I got nudged by my wife at the cinema. So. Nice. <laughs> I know that guy. Not the giant monkey, the other guy. Yeah, not the um, giant monkey. So, so just briefly, <laughs> the um, the other picture with another minigun. Yes. This, do, you, do you have anything to, to tell us about this one? It's heavy. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this was another, uh, actually, again, in Hawaii. Um, Hawaii gets used quite a bit uh, to simulate Southeast Asia mm. uh, for American... Uh, productions it's, it's a lot easier sometimes to do it in Hawaii it's even though you have to fly there it's an island and all that it's still part of the continent or part of the the 50 states of the United States and so as far as legalities and shipping and things like that it's actually easier to do it in Hawaii um, that particular M134 as you can see has been custom converted into a handheld version which you would not want to shoot a handheld version of a real live fire minigun uh luckily we were firing it of course with blanks we don't we don't shoot live rounds on a movie set um and again it's a, a good example of an armor winding up in wardrobe uh, basically the majority of the shots in the film if you see the gun firing but you don't see the actor's face that was me in wardrobe firing the gun. Because on film sets, we, we frequently have uh, multiple sets. There'll be a first unit and a second unit, and they might actually be filming concurrently. And usually you can do certain things with a stunt double. Uh, that's why you see a lot of film scenes where it's being filmed over the shoulder. You can't see their face. Right. It's not really them, that kind of thing. Uh, and in this particular case, there was a series of shots where uh, the, the actual actor was doing other scenes on a totally different part of the island. And I remained on what was called second unit, which is usually what's known as the action unit. Yeah. Um, first unit does a lot of dialogue and kind of establishes things and then they move on. And then second unit comes in behind them and usually cleans up all the actual detail parts, the action sequences, stunt the hard work, work and things like that. Eh, you know, first unit is just as hard. I mean, if you're if you're an actor, let's say on a western, and you have to ride a horse, repeat your dialogue, shoot a gun, all, all that at the same time, it it's stressful. It's it's a lot of hard work, and then you've got the crew the camera people, the sound people, and all of them who have to chase you, it's very demanding for the crew as well. So uh, it's not really, one is not harder than the other. They're just mm -hmm. harder in different ways. There, there's a different character to a first unit or, or a second unit. And a lot of that also has to do with the director. Sometimes yeah. the directors like to be involved in both of them at the same time. Sometimes the director will just take care of first unit and he'll have a second unit director that takes care of all the, the action. And usually they get very specialized. Like if it's a racing car movie, if it's a gunfire movie, if it's an aircraft related movie, you might choose a different second unit director each time because they have developed a specialty uh, yeah. for certain, certain parts. Okay. Um, so we, uh, you, you sent this one through. This, this is you giving instruction um to i'm not entirely sure who to, to tell us what's going on here and so this this kind of this is the flip side of you providing boot camp type instruction to actors and extras but you also have provided and, and do provide um professional training to to people who who do this stuff for real don't you so so iss or independent studio services which uh, is owned by the bilson family uh, has been in business since 1977. And while our primary goal 
is to service um, motion picture and television in the entertainment industry. We also have a, a small percentage of our work is in the real world uh, because of the weapons inventory we have because of the special group of people that we've drawn together in the weapons department that come from all walks of life, former mm. military, former law enforcement, people directly from the film industry. Uh, but because of that knowledge and, and the weaponry that we have, we have also been drafted into teaching like foreign weapons classes to the military. Uh, we assist law enforcement with active shooter training and things like that. And so this uh, particular uh, photo was taken uh, at a place that I can't tell you about uh, where I was teaching uh, foreign weapons classes to a specific military unit that I can't tell you about. <laughs> and it was in uh -huh. a very, uh, very, very interesting training base that is located in a spot that I can't tell you about, um, <laughs> but uh, you can cool see story, I, got to, <laughs> I, I got to uh, play soldier again, uh, got dressed up in uniform. And uh, it's one of the more rewarding parts of our job too, in that we do delve into the make-believe world in film, but by keeping ourselves active mm. in the real world as well, when we have to go back and be that technical advisor that we were talking about earlier, we have... We have bona fides. We, we can say we actually know what we're talking about and this is why. Yeah, and that feeds into that sense of realism that, that geeks we like hope, me really we hope, enjoy. We oh, hope so. And, and Jonathan, there are no geeks like you. There's, <laughs> there's you and then there's other people, but there, no, there aren't any other geeks like you. Um, I will take that as a compliment. <laughs> hey, take it. I'm not saying, take it however you want to take it. But uh, <laughs> yes, hopefully that realism bleeds into our work and it is recognized. It does. Yeah, it definitely does. You, if, even if, um, even if other uh, unreality intrudes and the director's vision or, you know, the actor's refusal to kind of go along with, with what you probably advised and it, it, other factors notwithstanding, you can always tell. Um, yeah. if I've started guessing which, which productions that you guys have worked on, um, but without being aware of it, and uh, usually right. Um, <laughs> so we've got here, this looks crazy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's a Glock 18, isn't it? Uh, Maybe. <laughs> or is it a, a converted 17? I refuse to answer that question that's on fine. the grounds that I might incriminate myself. That's um, no, fine. in fact, this, this is an earlier, uh, actually second generation um, Glock 18, uh, a very early gun. Um, and it, it, you know, you, it's a little bit hard to tell, but we are actually indoors. Mm. We are inside of a sound stage, and that's why you can see a very, very high ceiling, um, empty, giant sound stage. And in this particular uh, photo, we are doing a post-production sound recording. Sure. So the armorer on, on a big budget film is an integral part of the production from the very beginning to the very, very end. And in pre-production, which you'll usually have about 16 weeks of pre-production, we get involved with choosing what gun each character uses, training the actors, doing what we call show and tells where we lay out a whole bunch of different guns and we let the actors and the directors experiment with different looks and things like that. Then of course we, we move into the production stage of the film uh, which again is usually about 16 weeks on a, on a large budget film. And we're out on set with the guns, continuing to oversee the safety, the maintenance, the functioning of the guns, uh, technical advisor work like we, we've already discussed. And then when the cameras stop rolling, you go into the post-production element of the film. And that's where you know, visual effects might get done. That's where sound effects get done. Um, different, different special effects shots might get done. And uh, most of the gunfire recording is usually done in post-production. Um, so this particular one was, was a full auto element uh, of being indoors. So we needed a very echo 
kind of effect. Um, and one of the studio sound stages was rented out uh, for us to do. That was only one of the guns that I fired uh, over a series of days. Um, and you can see, indeed, this was in full auto because uh, you could see the multiple pieces of brass in the air. More interestingly than that, I took this particular picture and wrote across it to my wife on our 30th wedding anniversary, <laughs> you light up my life. Oh. And put it in a frame <laughs> and, and gave it to her. So it's a good illustration of the work we do and also a good way if you forget an anniversary gift to just kind of, you know, pull that in real quick and, and utilize it. That's pretty slick. Yes. <laughs> and I did I didn't I didn't forget the anniversary, but I do have it on my wall uh, that I did put in a nice frame for her. And it does say to my loving wife, Karen, you light up my life. Yeah, which so she those, does. Those giant Hollywood muzzle flashes have, have paid off. Absolutely, at least in this particular case. Yeah, uh, or as we know, that uh, directors love massive muzzle flashes. But, um... Well, you know, there's a technical element to it as well that, you know, as it's a little bit different now with video, but with film, as the film goes through, you have those bars between each frame mm. and you lose, even with video, you lose information in those bars. And so in order to catch like this much flash for the audience to see, we have to film that much flash. Otherwise, mm -hmm. it doesn't really look like the gun's firing. Yeah. And of course, gunfire is very dramatic. We like seeing that. So it does usually look a little bit more exaggerated than uh, a knowledgeable gun person would think. Uh, but again, we're, we're telling stories. We're entertaining. Yeah. Uh, if there's a little bit of suspension of disbelief, I think that's okay. Oh yeah, it's always a balance, isn't it? Sure. Um, so, so this is of, of the of the photos you've sent me. This is the most intriguing. This wow. we're going back here to to and a question that um, I, I was always going to ask is what where how did you get? I get asked this as well, doing what I do. How did you get to where you are today? What what got you into guns? What you got? What got you into working in the movies? Well, I, I usually I I usually describe it as uh, as saying that my my misspent youth caused me to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, and it's been downhill since you know <laughs> that that point. Um, but I I basically have been involved with firearms my entire life. My my father, may he rest in peace, was a mechanical engineer that always worked for defense contracting companies and uh, uh, different governments. And so at a very, very young age, um, we moved to Israel because um, he got hired by the Israeli Ministry of Defense uh, to work on whatever it was that he worked on. Uh, mm. He was also an avid uh, target shooter. So there were always guns in the house. Yeah. So at you know, age six, I can remember sitting at the kitchen table with him, helping him clean his handguns and going out to the range with him and, and stuff like that. And of course, you know, as a young child, I was very, very upset with the fact that, that my father had guns of his own and I wasn't allowed to have guns of my own. And so I started making them. And, and what you see here, um, that was probably done when I was about 10 or 11. Uh, and I handmade each one of those, um, you know, over many, many months and, you know, years of, of coming up with blueprints of my own and trying to figure out measurements by scaling things from photographs out of, you know, Guns and Ammo magazine. Uh, although these particular ones, I actually copied more out of the old Soldier of Fortune <laughs> magazine because that was kind of a hot ticket uh, back in the early 70s and everything and um yeah the the you know and i wasn't i wasn't a big kid for for getting something like that and running around and playing with the guns <clears throat> i like building them you know sure. um yeah. actually fabricating them and you know the the middle gun on the left there that's supposed to be an uzi nine millimeter and the buttstock actually collapses you can actually fold it up into the folding position the 
top one is, is clearly uh, an FNFAL, and you can see the folding uh, carry handle, which actually pivoted up and, up and down and everything. And I spent months polishing and staining the wood to make the, the grips look like that they were real, you know, butt stocks and forends and things like that. So um, yeah, misspent youth, wrong place, wrong time. Well, <clears throat> I'd say well spent given, given what you do now. Th those are those look amazing. Have you kept any of, of, of them? Do they still exist? No, and unfortunately, <laughs> um, one of the uh, one of the downsides to the way kind of life takes over is when you do wind up travel, uh, you you end up having to stuff. That it's just not worth dragging with you uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, I do have, you know, fond memories of uh, the, the FN FAL uh, up top because as a, a young teenager, um, I actually got to meet uh, Rafael Eitan, who was the chief of staff of the Israeli army at the time. And I presented that to him as a gift and him being both a career military person, as mm -hmm. well as an amateur carpenter. He really appreciated the woodwork that was put in uh, to that. So that was, that was kind of a cool thing as, yeah. as you know, uh, in my pre-military years getting to meet him. I then later on served under him uh, during my, my military service. But uh, mm. you know, as, as a 15 year old meeting him and being able to give him that as a gift, it was like, wow, that was, that was really cool. Yeah, that, that is really cool. I mean, I, I can tell you, having worked with some wooden mock-ups for, uh, created for the uh, SA-80 program, mm -hmm. these are better than, than what the Royal Small Arms Factory was able to produce. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Just from the photo. So, so, if, so if things don't work out for me in Hollywood, I, I've got someplace to go and still have a job? Exactly. Well, not at Enfield, but uh, sadly. But yes, yeah, I, I'd say so. Um, cool. So um, you mentioned military service. Um, I think we our faces might be obscuring you on the uh, APC on the right or the other yeah. vehicle on the right. But so when when were these taken? Um, so those two photographs were probably taken in late 1983, maybe early 1984. Uh, those are actually in the Beka Valley in Lebanon. Um, if I don't think we've mentioned it, but uh, my military service, I grew up in Israel, like I said, so my military service was in the IDF. I was actually mm. in, the, in the Israeli military. And um, on the left there is, is my friend, my best friend when I was in the military service. Uh, his name was Ofer. And unfortunately, he's passed away and is no longer oh. with us. But um, that Something was our, our M113 armored personnel carrier, which back in the day was state of the art. Nowadays, it's it's not, but um, you can clearly see we're, we're loaded for bear there. We've got all mm -hmm. of our gear. We're carrying 14 magazines. We've got, you know, grenades and M2HB mounted up on top of the mm -hmm. uh, M113. And then in the background, you know, if you know you, what you're looking at, you can actually see that there are three mag 58s under covers oh, on the backside okay. yeah. of, of the M113. So that was, uh, that was an earnest attempt to make that into the best combat fighting vehicle uh, <laughs> that we were able to do yeah. uh, at the time. And you've got the Galils there? Yeah, those were, um, that's actually not a Galil. Uh, it's Ooh. called a Glilon. Ah. It was the, uh, what is known in the West as the SAR version oh, of okay. the Galil. You can see that there's a, the, the wooden hand grip is not there. It's a plastic one. There is no yeah. bipod on this. And it's a shortened barrel because this was pre-Micro Galil. The Micro mm. Galil didn't exist uh, at this time. And this was the shortest version of the homemade, you know, homegrown indigenous weapon system, which was made in Israel at the time. And since it was the shortest, that's what was issued out to SF-type units. 
And the unit I was in was a special reconnaissance type unit. And so that's what we got issued. Um, except for one guy in every team who still got issued the full size ARM Galil, because right. these shorter ones, you can't shoot a rifle grenade off of. The barrel is not long enough. Um, but the ARM, you could. And so we always wanted that capability somewhere in the team. And so yeah. one poor guy, usually the guy that I was mad at, he would be the guy <laughs> that I would wind up assigning, you know, to get, get the full-size ARM. Yeah, I, I think the same thing happened with the L86 um, light support weapon. Ironically named light support weapon in the British force. You know what? Militaries are the same no matter where you go in the world, uh, and and that just you know it's one of those things that happen. Those those got got given to the new recruit, uh, I gather. Yes. yes. Yeah. So um, I, one of the questions I wanted to get in, um, as I knew, time is getting away from us, but I I know that you're able to stay on for a, for a bit longer. Is that right? I'm yours for as long as you need me, Jonathan. Great. Hopefully, other other our viewers are similarly not engaged. But um, and if they're not, tough because we're going to carry on. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you you know you have a tremendous clearly we, we've seen already, and, and from the job that you do, a tremendous knowledge of modern firearms. But you're also a, a you're a buff of uh, you know you're a firearms a historical firearms buff as well, aren't you? And weapons generally, arms and armor. Yeah. I mean, so you, that, that's you, why we all get into this, right? I mean, that's why I do what I do. That's why you do it at the armories, uh, the fantastic work of preservation that you guys do. Um, and to me personally, the older stuff is kind of the much cooler stuff. I mean, an M4 is great, but anybody can just take an M4, put a magazine in it and fire the, the weapon system. Um, some of the older stuff, it's like you really not only do you need to kind of like learn something, but it, it's not just a matter of memory of learning it and then you're done. It's a matter of understanding the designer when they built the gun 200 years ago, what were they thinking? Why did they put a specific design element into it? And so it, it's kind of like a, a mental kind of detective game that you got to go through. Some of these older weapons, there's no manuals for them. Uh, sometimes they're prototypes and there was only one or two of them made. And when you come across stuff like that, um, as I'm sure you have at, at the, the museum, you know, um, it, it becomes a real kind of mental game. And that's where you start, you know, you start sharpening your uh, knowledge of firearms, not by learning something because you read it in a book, but by mm -hmm. truly understanding what the designer was thinking when they built or designed a specific firearm. And you'd be surprised how many times, you know, old historic elements start creeping into modern designs. You know, like they say there's nothing new under the sun and we just keep reinventing history. And it, that's, it's so true. It really yeah. is. I mean, if you think about a cavalryman in the Napoleonic Wars with a sash with a carbine hanging at the end of it. Some people see a big leather sash. I see a single point sling. Yeah. And what are we all using now tactically? Single point slings. Yeah. So, um, you know, you got to give the people, you know, far back in history a lot more credit than they get sometimes. They were kind of limited by the technology of their time. Mm -hmm. But but the human brain, the human imagination has never been limited. No. And, and it's those those kind of, you know, forebearers, those, you know, original giants who have brought us to where we are nowadays. At yeah, least I think absolutely. so. Yeah. So I, do you have a favorite historic firearm? P people ask, ask me this and I struggle to to answer. Um, yeah. But I, but I know you have I, a I, spot for this. I got to say, I got a soft spot in my heart for uh, what we're looking at right now, which is a one of the three different versions of a Lamat revolver. Um, very unique weapon. Um, to the novice, when they look at this, it looks like a regular revolver, but the difference here is it had nine shots in the cylinder instead of the normal five or six that you would have. So back in the day, that was a big advantage. 
Uh, also, it looks like it has two barrels. Um, the reason for that is it does have two barrels and the one on the bottom actually fires like a shotgun load. So you could put shot in there and then you'd have the cylinder that would shoot nine shots out of the upper barrel. So this was very much an assault weapon of its day uh, in, in the American Civil War and shortly thereafter when single shot muskets, uh, muzzle loaders, or maybe some single shot breech loaders were still the norm. All of a sudden you had this 10 shot handgun and if you were mounted troops, you could clearly carry multiples of these because the horse is carrying the weight, not you yourself. And so, so think about that. You could, you could carry 40 shots before you had to reload if you were carrying two pairs of Lamat revolvers. And so this was like ages, leaps and bounds ahead of its time. And so I think for a variety of reasons, but, but mainly for that technological one, um, this is my favorite uh, historical firearm. And as you well know, the story behind it of a Southerner who developed it, but because the South was not industrialized, a lot of these got manufactured in England because England backed the Confederate States during the American Civil War. And <laughs> this was one of the items. Oh, it's a historical fact. You guys are always know. like that, you know. Um, uh, it, it's a historical fact that one hey, of the we, we, we sold arms to all sides at, at, at just about every point. <laughs> to, to, to be fair, you know, if, if, if you people haven't looked into the history of this, you should. But it was a very interesting time in, in history. Uh, and while the UK did supply some arms to the southern states, they were never going to fully support or join the Confederate States of America because England had been the forerunner of abolishing slavery in the 1800s. And yep. there was no way morally, uh, even if they had some sympathies for the South due to cultural kind of elements of the lifestyle, UK or, you know, or the English empire at the time, there was no real chance of them ever coming in on the British or on the Confederate side. So hmm. it's just one of those curiosities of history that along with, you know, Whitworth rifles, the Lamats also came in. These are the items when you hear about these blockade runners coming hmm. in from Europe, one of the main items that came in on those blockade runners was the Lamat revolvers manufactured in Europe for the Confederacy. Yeah. So, so are you, this, this leads me to, to another question. Are, are you responsible for the, the man in black's Lamat revolver in Westworld? Boy, responsible for just sounds so ominous, you know. Oh, no, it's a, uh, it's a very good I, thing in my book. Um, I practically yeah, cheered when know, I saw uh, that. Westworld is amazing uh, television series that the creative team on it, everyone from the writers, directors, producers, down to uh, the lowliest crew member, just amazing creative team. They've come up with a, a fantastic um, reboot of the original movie, which is, you know, decades old now, but they've managed to not only just reboot it, but exceed it. You know, they've taken the storyline even further. And uh, Ed Harris, who I've had uh, the honor and pleasure of working with on several different uh, projects, he's the man in black. You know, he's the main bad guy, kind of kind of the Yul, Yul Brenner mm -hmm. character from the original movie. And uh, they needed they needed a special firearm for him and we were able to give some input of course, we gave them a variety of choices, but I kind of had the Lamat in my back, back pocket, as it were, that, it, you know, if nothing else worked, I was sure that that was going to be the one. And my gosh, it's, it's such an impressive firearm that uh, how could it not be the Men in Black's gun? Yeah, great choice. And that, that first season in particular is, is just yeah. a, a landmark, really, I think, in, in, in yeah. TV um, for, for action, among other reasons. 
Um, so well, again, we and, and, and mainly because of the creative writing too. I mean, mm. I don't want to give a spoiler oh, if you right. haven't watched Westworld, but the the intermingling of timelines and storylines and bringing all the threads together at the final episode for the season finale, I, to say that it was artfully done just doesn't do it justice. It's just, yeah. you know, a, amazing collaborative effort. We actually have a, a Lamat question that's that's come through from Facebook from sure. uh, pa Patrick uh, Dusablon. I probably mispronounced your name. I'm very sorry if I have. And the question is, uh, wasn't the Lamat hideously expensive and therefore unaffordable for general issue? There's probably some truth to that, isn't there? Well, um, I think that, you know, the American Civil War is kind of a high watermark as far as the Industrial Revolution, at least in the United States. England kind of, you know, preceded the United States a little bit in industrialization. Um, I think it was to make it with nine uh, chambers in it compared to a cylinder with six chambers in it. But the overall size of the gun, you know, th this picture doesn't really give us a good comparison. Shame on you, Jonathan. <laughs> but this, the overall size of the gun, this is, this is like a 44 Dirty Harry Magnum compared to a 38 yeah. Snubnose. So the sheer amount of material that went into this gun, the engineering of being able to switch between the upper barrel and the lower barrel, um, I would agree with that, that it definitely was more expensive than let's say your average 1851 Colt Navy that had already been perfected and been in production exactly. for a decade before the war. Um, yeah. However, the, the, the examples that you still see, like this was, was a famously favored gun of PTE Beauregard and of uh, Jeb Stewart. They all prized their Lamatt revolvers uh, as Southern generals. And the examples that you can see in museums, the fit and finish was beautiful. And so I don't know that um, cost really became an issue. This was back in the day when, when gun makers were still considered artisans. Sure. You know, and, and there was there was a melding of the wood and the checkering and the metal and the heat treat uh, much more so than uh, today. There, there is still an element of it today, but clearly today it's much more of a manufactured mm. product. Whereas back then to be a gun maker was to be like a sculptor or a painter, you know, or something like that. So Patrick, yeah. I agree with you. It was it was probably on average a little bit more expensive than your average gun out there, but well worth uh, spending the money on because of the tactical advantage that it gave you. Yeah, and it, as you as you say, you know, as an officer's pistol, an officer's handgun, private purchase that cost doesn't re isn't really a factor. If you were looking to outfit outfit a whole whole troop of cavalry with two of these. Then the cost margin over a, a colt or something might might well be prohibitive, for uh, sure, or at, least, or at least not worth the additional perceived advantage of having the extra shots and the shotgun yeah. barrel. But hey, if I was riding a horse into battle in the in the mid nineteenth century, I think I'd want nine shots plus one shotgun. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. So yeah, that that's a. I need to work on my own favorite because um, that's that's a good one to have. I think in the back pocket, as you say. Absolutely. Um, so uh, getting into some of your um, well, designs that you've worked on or, or directly responsible for. And tell us about the design process, because you, you, clearly armors, movie armors are involved in building the stuff and making it real and then wrangling it, shooting it, training people on it. What about the design process? What, what's your involvement in that? And we're seeing here uh, some evidence of that. Yeah, so um, the, one of the, the cool parts about way, working in the entertainment industry is that every single project is different. And you might think that, well, if you do 10 Westerns in a row, they must all start being a little bit similar, but, but they're not because uh, whenever you're dealing with a creative kind of endeavor, uh, <laughs> it, it's like, like I said, like, like a bunch of artists, you can have 10 guys that are all sculptors but they all do it in a different way. They all prefer a different medium. Uh, they all start differently. Painters the same way. 
Um, I just read a, a comment from one of my favorite uh, artists, Joe Jusco, who's doing a new beautiful uh, cover series uh, for a new release of Edgar Rice Barrow's novels. And he explained how he likes to paint his, his artwork. And some painters like to do the background first and then the main element in the foreground. And some painters like to do the foreground element first and then the background. And so that's a good illustration of how things can be different. Mm. Uh, so every process is different. Sometimes the art department comes to us and says, it's a script point in the story. The gun has to do X, Y, Z. What should it look like? Other times they come to us with drawings like you see here. And they say, we want the gun to look like this, but it has to do X, Y, Z, make it do that. Um, this particular one was done the way we really like to do it, which is where the art department comes to us. They say, this is the idea we have. And we say, okay, if that's your idea, we think we should build it around this real gun and then they take the visual elements of the real gun, go back and make these drawings, bring it back to us and we can build it. So we get in kind of on the ground level. It's a lot easier than having to reverse engineer something um, that, you know, it's like, gosh, if we, if we had only been asked about this, we would have been told you it would have been easier, let's say if the charging handle was on the left side or, you know, some element uh, like that. Um, so these are, these are original artist renderings. The, the one on the top right hand side uh, is about a five foot one to one scale um, rendering or blueprint, if you will. And I have that framed on my office wall um, I remember, as, kind yeah. of, as kind of a keepsake. Um, but yes, th this was a challenging uh, project. It was originally done for a movie called Showtime, starring Eddie Murphy and Robert De Niro and Rene Russo. Um, myself and another gunsmith by the name of Jim Boland, who sadly passed away many years ago, uh, we spent, I think it was, it was either 27 or 29 days straight wow. at the shop, never went home, worked 14, 15 hours <laughs> a day to get the first two prototypes functional because as you wow. can see in the drawing it's kind of a transformer gun it folds up into a smaller package and then yep. it folds out into a bigger package and it had to be functional in both positions and as as i'm sure you know the viewers that i hope we have watching today they're <laughs> probably viewing this because they're interested in guns they probably understand the complexity of having it work in both configurations. If it was one or the other, it would have been easier, but to make it work in both, it's, it's very difficult. Yeah, and of course this ended up in the series Firefly uh, and became a, a, a bit of a legend, yeah. having been designed for something else. And so weird how these things develop, um, not necessarily the way the viewing public might think it happens, but uh, we made this gun, obviously, uh, as a rental house, we earn our living by renting the same gun over and over and over again. Mm. Um, and this one has a very particular look. And because we designed it specifically for a specific production, we weren't really going to rent it again. It was kind of their design and all that. But later on, we altered the design a little bit and it grew into the now pop icon, which is known as Vera. Right, it was yeah. a gun that actually got a name. It became a character Part in of a, a television series called Firefly, um, and that's a really unique thing to have happen to a prop. And and again, you can take great pride when you when you're you help in the creative element of this, and you see people's eyes light up with, "Oh my God, that's Vera from Firefly." Yeah. Um, or, you know, Dirty Harry's gun or the gun from Miami Vice or whatever it else it, it might be. And you, you realize that people, even people like you and me were interested in firearms, but not everybody is. 
and yet it transcended the fact that it is a firearm. It's, it's become a pop culture icon. If you say cowboy gun now to someone, even if they're not a gun enthusiast, they know what it looks like. Yeah. If you say Vera to you know a, a sci-fi fan, they know exactly what you're talking about. And so, uh, yeah, it, it, this was one of my one of my prouder moments. Um, nowadays, I I spend a lot of time developing stuff, designing stuff, going out on set, dealing with customers, dissecting scripts, training actors, and things like that. But this one was done back in a time in my career where I literally nuts and bolts, hands on, I made that, you know, yeah. stood at a lathe, stood at a mill. Uh, and me and Jim, we wound up making 10 of them. Uh, so yeah, it's Cause, pretty, pretty what, cool. As you like to say, one is none. Yeah, you know, in the prop world, that, that is a saying, it, it, you know, whether it's a firearm or anything else, it's, it's if you have one, you have none. Uh, you always have to have redundancies. You always have to have backups. Uh, again, we talked about a first unit and a second unit. If they both need the same prop at the same time, what do you do? You, you must have multiples. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, no, it's a tremendous piece of work that you should be very proud of. And uh, it's just going to keep surfacing. Thank you. For, for decades it, it's a it's a classic yep up there with the pulse rifle and uh, lightsabers and things like that so um, sure. also a great design is is um mal's blaster from from firefly uh, the the moses that... brothers frontier model b blaster i'm glad you remembered the the full title because i <laughs> you <laughs> didn't oh shame on you <laughs> So this is this is um, like I like I like saying I'm I'm thinking about doing this kind of thing for a living. So I try to keep up on this kind of stuff and remember all the names. I, I don't know it. how that'll go, but I'll I'll let you know how it works out for me. You'll get there eventually. Okay. <laughs> so this is um part of it. We, we've seen we've already seen guns with add-ons with with greeblies with with stuff disguising their outline you know we have a few in the collection from from things like star wars and aliens that work that way as well some things have a sort of clamshell that that envelops them and this design is is a, a sort of really sophisticated version of that isn't it so you've got the taurus is it uh, 85 is it taurus model 85 snub nose 38 and and you've and, done a lot to that <laughs> yeah um so one of the things uh, we do, like you said, we build a shell or a prosthetic, whatever you want to call it, that goes over a real firearm and it makes it look like something that it's not. In this particular case, it makes it look like a space gun. Um, there's a lot of good reasons to do that. Uh, it gives the real weight of a firearm to the actor. Um, yeah. Excuse me. It allows the actor to actually fire a real gun and react to it, whether it's their eyes blinking or their hand flinching or whatever it may be. And those elements help the actor do a better job of selling to the viewer that, yeah, I am in space and I've got this space blaster and that's really what I'm doing. I'm shooting, you know, if it's just a rubber prop and they just point it, it, it doesn't really feel like you're shooting a firearm. And in this particular case, you can see that if you build a housing or, or cladding uh, around the gun and you can't even figure out what the gun inside it is, yep. then we must have done a really good job um, of a design element. And uh, this particular one, for a variety of reasons, it was chosen to be the Model 85. Uh, that solves a lot of problems for us on a film set because now the gun can still fire, but you don't have to digitally remove ejecting shell cases. Because after all, this is supposed to be a laser blaster. Yep. There's not supposed to be shell cases ejecting out of it. And by using the, the trick of using a revolver for that, you can shoot multiple shots and then you cut and then you open up the shell and you reload the gun, you close it back up again and you keep on moving. And when the editor, who's really the person that brings all the strings and all the creative elements together, um, 
because that's what a film is, is a bunch of different elements. I, I like to compare it to a mosaic. Each department has one little stone and they spend the whole movie polishing up that little stone. And then everybody gives all the stones to the editor and the editor is the one that creates this beautiful mosaic of a film by putting all those little pieces together. And so the editor makes it look like the blaster shot 15 times in a row without ever needing to reload it uh, because he's created along with us true movie magic. And, and that's what we're doing. We're creating an illusion of gunfire in a safe manner um, that is not possible to do safely in the real world. Yeah. And that's pretty amazing. And it beats the heck out of CGI muzzle flashes. And yeah. Every day, all day long. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, CGI, it, it's, it's a... It's a trick that you use in your bag of tricks for specific spots when you need to use it. Yeah. If you use it in the right way, it's a magnificent tool. And, and, and it's there. It, again, it's for a specific job. If you overuse it, Mm -hmm. Oh, well, we don't, we don't need to shoot a real gun. We'll just do everything CGI. That's when you look at it and you go, man, this is not, something looks wrong there. I don't know what it is, but it just doesn't look right. And it's because of that. Um, you, you always need to use the right tool for the right job. And uh, CGI has its place, but it, it's not for continuous gunfire, at least in my opinion. Sure. So we, we have a question from a, a Nick Green Arrow asking okay. if, if the grip on that is from an 1858 Remington. Uh, no, it, it's somewhat reminiscent of that, uh, but it was basically uh, modeled after the Remington, but totally made from scratch. The right. angle is just a little bit more kind of straightened out. The, the Remington has a little bit more of a curve to it. Um, so it, it, I'm happy to see that you saw the inspiration there, Nick. Uh, very good eye, my, my compliments to you. Uh, but it's, it's not like we just took the grip off of an 1875 and slapped it on there. We, just, we used it as a guide and then created new grips with a slightly different uh, profile. Well, the, the overall, it, it sounds silly, but it just the grip helps, but every other aspect as well. It looks like a real thing. You know, it really it does. does look and like the, the, the an artifact aging, that never existed. Yeah, the aging element on the, the upper version, the, the screen mm. version, is gorgeous. It looks like an old, worn gun. When that shell that's encapsulating the, the Taurus 85, when that was built, that was, you know, it's made out of brass. It was bright, shiny, gold colored brass. It looked brand new and everything, but that didn't fit the character. Sure. And so, after building it and perfecting it and making it look beautiful, we then had to age it down and make it look a little bit more corroded and rusty and, and well-worn. Okay. Um, if you remember, Firefly was depicted as a space Western, you know, and so yeah. it needed to have that well-worn look uh, on it. And uh, what could be more we've been successful. Totally. What could be more space western than something that looks like a revolver from the future? Exactly. Um, so some a couple more builds here. I, I'm a I'm a great fan of Oblivion, um, which which is on the top there. That that's a, yep. a, a scar, a FN scar. Is that right under under that shell? Very well. Uh, described. ACR. That was ACR, actually an that was ACR. It. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then the bottom one clearly right. is is a Krinkov style uh, AK. And that was that was for the um, Terminator. One Genesis. of the Terminator films, yeah. Again, that one when you get close, you can see a little bit more of the stuck-on elements of it, and everything. The uh, upper one is a little bit more well disguised. But mm. the the one of the things about film, you know, if you make it look too spacey looking, it's not believable. If you don't put enough elements on it, it's not believable. You have to find that that in-between sweet spot. So clearly on the gun on the top, you can still see the original pistol grip. You can see the original selector, the original trigger.
but then everything else that's been added, it gives you that, even if you're a gun enthusiast, it gives you that feeling of, you know, yeah, that looks believable. I, I could believe that the gun from today evolved over the next hundred years into the gun that I'm seeing uh, exactly. in this science fiction movie. Um, and again, you know, that, uh, that element is very important. The, the, the film was a Tom Cruise film who's an amazing talent and he, he works very hard at, you know, not just making his acting good in the film, because if he wanted to, he could say, hey, I'm an actor, I'm being paid to play this part. I'm just gonna play my part well enough and be done with. But no, he takes an interest in the overall look of the film and, and the whole creative effort of it. And so to be able to make something like that, have it in his hands and have it work successfully, again, as, as a, a person who, who likes creating things with my own hands, that's pretty cool. I really, you know, it, it's a, a really satisfying thing. And then to be able to go to a movie theater and watch the viewing public watch the film and you get, cause, cause I already know what's going to happen in the movie. I don't need to see the movie. I was there when we were filming it. Right. So um, to go to a movie theater and watch the audience and see them laugh and cry and cheer and boo and throw popcorn at the screen. And then maybe, oh, their eyes light up when they see a new, new cool gun or when they see the actor do something with the gun and you can see them get enthusiastic and you think, wow, I had, I had just a little bit of making that person laugh. For two hours, they forgot about their troubles at home or whatever, and, and maybe I had just a little bit to do with that. That's a cool feeling and that's why we all work long hours and you know, we miss birthdays and anniversaries and all that to get a specific project done uh, because of that satisfying feeling. Yeah, well, I, I can tell you that it's certainly appreciated. Um, you know, even the people who don't. Understand that. Well, absolutely. Even the people who don't know that exactly who's worked on which bit. It, it, it's as you say, it's a part of a, of a bigger picture that that contributes yeah. to their enjoyment, to, to their um, excitement, their, you know, even learning things from from film and for and for those of us who are super nerdy about a given aspect whether that's costume or or in, in this case prop prop weapons we always notice and we always care and appreciate when people put in the amount of effort and, and skill that you do so yeah by the way you. i think, I think <laughs> the promo the promo on the royal armory's website preferred to use the word geeky not nerdy <laughs> Uh, oh, there's a whole but debate. I, but I understood that. what you were what you were talking about. Yeah, there's, there's a long running debate on that. Well, let's not yeah. get into it. So, <laughs> so, a couple more couple more crazy things before we better um, sort of move to some to some questions and things. Uh, uh, the these crazy double deagles, as uh, as I like to refer to them, these these are from Green Hornet. Yeah. Yes. Uh, double barreled, uh, double mechanism handgun. Uh, both barrels shoot at the same time. Um, the, the angle at which I photographed that cleverly, you know, conceals the fact that it's a single handgun uh, buried in between those two barrels. Those are fake barrels. And we basically had kind of a Y splitter on the end of the real muzzle that then vented gases to the two fake ones that you see there. And so when you fire a single shot, both slides move, both muzzles have a muzzle flash. And then in the film, if the effects people blow two holes in a wall, we have just created an illusion where the viewer goes, well, no, they just, they shot two bullets. I, I saw both barrels go bang and I saw two holes in the wall. It's gotta be a real thing. And in fact, it's just part of our movie magic. It's an illusion uh, that we created. And in this case, created very successfully. Yeah, that's, that's a tremendous piece of work as well. Uh, to, and, and that's part of, part of the enjoyment of this must be to create things that, that either never existed historically or don't exist yet or may not ever be practical. And in something like a comic book movie, you can really go to town and, and create something like that. Yeah, and you know, that's one of the, the behind the scenes look that most people don't understand about a film. They, they see an actor running around with a gun like that and they think 
it must be real. It must be doable in the real world to have a gun like that. And then when they come to our shop and they might visit and see it and they pick it up and they go, oh my God, the thing weighs 14 pounds. How, you know, how, how can that, I saw the guy running around with it in the movie. Well, he might've been running around with a rubber stunt version. And only when he actually did the gunfire, you know, he didn't carry that thing the whole time in his holster because it's too heavy. Because in fact, like you said, it is not practical to do and use it in the real world. We again have created an illusion like the one that you just popped up on the screen here. Yeah, well, that, that's a hell of an illusion, um, which, which we've not not yet seen on film, I, I gather. Not I, yet. I, it was yeah. new to me. And so, so, so tell us what we're looking at here. This thing is nuts. So, so <laughs> this is uh, um, uh, uh, the, that particular night. I didn't sleep very well, so I was a little <laughs> bit edgy when I got into the shop that day. And um, they needed a unique weapon for a specific character in a film, and uh, it, it's one of these kind of more slightly futuristic kind of out there on the very ragged edge kind of uh, franchises. And it needed to be very unique. It couldn't just be shiny and flashy. It had to be something, as you said, that no one had ever seen before. Um, so on the left there, you can see how I played around with, you know, some Photoshop, excuse me. And I took some elements of different things and tried to kind of spatially create a thing that we could show to the director and say, is this kind of what you're thinking of? Uh, which is one of the things, again, the computers are great for, so you don't have to build it, get it rejected, and then go build another one. You know, you can come up with an illustration like this. And then on the right-hand side, you can see uh, Will, one of our, our armors demonstrating how you would hold such a behemoth uh, <laughs> with five different barrels on it and everything. Um, very well received. Uh, a lot of people liked the look of it and everything, but did not make the final cut of the film. Uh, but who knows, we might see it in some future installment on some other uh, project and uh, someday I'll get it, get it into a movie. I'm kind of proud of that one. I think it you know, when you look down the muzzles of it, I think that would be an amazing shot in a film for an actor to kind of come up on target and see this cluster of, of barrels. And so we'll, we'll just keep plugging along and we'll get it into a yeah. film sooner or later. It's like when a really good song gets, gets uh, dropped from a, from a classic album and then it shows up on a, on a later one. So uh, again, forward. it's a beautiful analogy. And again, it just shows again, a different aspect of a creative endeavor. You know, when, when you're creative like that and you feel like everything's fallen into the right spot, that, as you say, that song eventually will become a hit, whether it was dropped from the collective album or not. So um, hopefully that's what will happen uh, with, uh, with this creation here. Yeah, well, I think we can probably move to questions if, if you're okay. up, up for that so let's let's see what we've got feel free to breathe briefly so um <laughs> terry henderson asks what elements of firearm handling really make you wince in movies and which movies get it right that one's from facebook uh Thank you, Terry, for captioning my pain uh, sometimes <laughs> as far as uh, some films go. Um, you know, okay, so, so one thing I want you to understand about a film is, first of all, rarely does a film get filmed in sequence. So when you start filming a movie, you don't start at the beginning of the movie and then you end at the end of the movie. It's little, like I said, mosaics, it's little pieces of patchwork. And there are times when that creates continuity mistakes. It just happens, okay? Um, but you gotta remember we're making a movie here. We're not making history. We're not, you know, solving cancer, you know, issues or anything like that. We're making a film, we're telling a story. And so sometimes 
if we have to suspend disbelief in order to get the director's story across, we do it. And here's the one that I always, I usually cringe at. Director has a police officer. He's going into a building. We know the bad guy's in there. The bad guy's killed a dozen people already. This is the climax of the film. We're searching the building, you know, in the dark with, you know, suspenseful music rising in the background and whatnot. And then we find the bad guy. Freeze. The bad guy doesn't freeze. Stop or I'll shoot. They don't stop. I really mean it. <laughs> Are you telling me that you went into this building where you know there's this, this serial murderer and you went in there with a gun that didn't have a round in the chamber? No police officer would do that. Um, and so that's one that I usually kind of uh, kind of cringe at a little bit. As the onset armorer, it's our job to inform the director that that would never really happen. And then they get to make the creative decision. I still want to do it anyway because it helps build the tension. Or thank you for pointing that out. Let's figure out a different way to make this scene work. Um, so, so that's one that, that kind of usually gets me. But again, a story. I'm doing a YouTube instructional video on tactics. We're, we're just telling a story. And as prop people, because firearms in the entertainment world are part of the prop department. So as prop people, our job is to take the vision, the imaginary vision of the director and make it a reality that he can film and put up on the screen. And so if that's what he or she wants, guess what? We'll do our due diligence of telling them that maybe it's not truly correct, but at the end of the day, as long as it's safe and it's not illegal, we wind up doing what the director wants. Yeah. And as, you, as you've alluded to before, this, the same applies to technical advice. Uh, same thing. We, yeah, we, we've, we've dabbled in that on, on a few things in the past. Yeah. And, um, you know, they might take one out of 10 suggestions and run with it and ignore the rest. Absolutely. <laughs> but yeah, Absolutely. the shotgun example is, is a great one. Even worse, when they rack it and a live round comes out. Yeah, well, you know, when they <laughs> rack it and a live round comes out, that's purely the mistake of the onset armor. It's, it's not a story point. It's not, oh, just, you know, they wanted to show something cool. That is clearly somebody did something wrong on yeah. that. And, and it happens, you know. Uh, one of the weird things, if you're ever out on a movie set, you know, we do a lot of rehearsals. There's a lot of things that could go wrong. We've got special effect explosions going off. We've got gunfire. We've got stunts that are happening. You have to rehearse these things so that nobody gets hurt. And there are times where for whatever reason, uh, because it helps the creative juices get going or whatever, the director decides, let's film the rehearsal. Okay? Right. And maybe, maybe the actor's inflection in their voice or some movement that they make, they do it one way in the rehearsal that they don't do in the actual cut, but it actually looks better in the rehearsal. And so the director decides, oh, that looked edgy. I really like that. Let's use that take, not realizing that that was just the rehearsal and there was actually a mistake in there. Or maybe they do realize the mistake and they go, I don't care, you know, so yeah. that happened with the gun. Who cares? You know, this was the element in the scene that I was really concentrating on. And that's the element that I like. So yeah, that, sure. that frequently happens. But uh, clearly, you know, uh, Terry, your question must be driven by the fact that you cringe at quite a few things on film. But next time you see a cringeworthy moment, uh, try to remember that there's all kinds of continuity things and and little mishaps that you, you don't know about um, or edits the way that it got cut together that that little mistake made more sense if it had been edited differently. 
but for a variety of reasons, this was what the final final edit was. Sure. So we've got another Facebook question here from uh, uh, Paul Maxted. Many movies feature crazy weapons, the steampunk stuff in Wild Wild West, for example. Yeah, good example. Yep. Are there any are there any crazy weapons you have used or you would have liked to have been involved with? Um, well, obviously the the Showtime and the Firefly yeah. <laughs> uh, Vera weapon. We did that. The gun from Oblivion was a pretty good build, as was the the one from Green Hornet and uh, Terminator. Uh, one of the other ones that I've uh, always been associated with was the silenced shotgun from No Country for Old Men. Oh. Unbelievable the the fan reaction. Um, to that, so I was I was pretty proud uh, of that one too. Again, everybody remembers certain elements about that film, but even if they're not gun enthusiasts, they remember that silenced shotgun. Um, so, so that was pretty cool. But I'll tell you, really, um, and it, it it almost becomes like a cliche or a joke out on set. But especially when I go out on set, and usually when we design something very unique we're also out on set with it because it's not like I can just give that to the average armorer. It's something that I've created myself and it might be a little bit finicky and, and, and all that. So, um, so I'm out there with it, but re the reality is whether it's a big show or a small show, whether it's a special gun or just the regular snub nose revolver, my favorite gun is always the one that I'm putting away at the end of the night Everybody got through the sh shoot okay. Everybody was safe. The scene worked the way it was supposed to work. The director's happy with the results. Then I don't care whether it was a five shot snub nose or it's a smoking hot minigun. I'm just as proud, you know, depending upon which one it is because that's, yeah. what, we, that's what we strive for. We live within the prop department. Doesn't matter what we're doing as long as it works, as long as they got what they wanted and everybody was safe. So yeah, uh, I, I hope, I hope that answers. Paul, Paul, I hope that answers your question. No, good answer. Uh, we uh, have a, a Facebook question. Uh, this is an interesting one, I think, um, from uh, uh, Shitij Raj. Forgive my pronunciation again, if I've got that wrong. What is the most common mishap that happens, um, I guess, on set? And what are your countermeasures for that? How do you deal with that? So um, eye line, what they call eye line to target is very important. Um, and in a lot of scenes where you'll have like one person opposing three or four other people and maybe they're doing a lot of back and forth with the gun. No, you be quiet. No, you be quiet. That, that kind of thing. <laughs> um, sometimes the sequencing gets messed up. You're supposed to go bang, bang, jump over here, one shot, bang, then bang, bang, and jump over there. And so uh, the timing elements are always uh, a very difficult thing. No matter how much training you give someone, no matter how much technical advising you give someone, no matter how um, safely you create the mechanism in the gun, once you hand that to another person, they are responsible for what happens with that element. And yet, as the armorer, you are still responsible for all the safety aspects that are going on. And so I think I mentioned earlier, when you watch a movie and you're watching the framing of the movie, the crew is just outside the frame. You can't see them, but, but they're standing there. Um, and that's the one that always gives me the most trouble is, is being close enough to jump in and stop someone, which I've had to do on occasion, run no, right in front of camera, even though they're still, they haven't yelled cut and it ruins the take. But I, I started to see something going wrong and I can't allow someone else to get hurt on my watch. That's why I'm there. And so that's the one that always kind of, kind of gets me jumpy. And again, that's why I say I'm always happier at the end of the night when I'm packing up the guns, everything's worked well, they got what they want, nobody got hurt and, and so on. Um, 
But but also, I think we mentioned this before too, um, that the every project being so different from the last one, that that challenge of figuring out like, okay, tonight my trouble spot is Jonathan. This is where I'm going to, forgive me, Jonathan. There was just no, an no, example. No. You know, Absolutely this is where I'm gonna to have to concentrate. Tomorrow, it might be some other element in it. And so every night is different. Every, you know, scene is challenging in, in and of itself. Sure, thank you for that. Uh, yep. we, we've had one question asked by, by two people. Um, okay. British, British Rambler, I'm guessing that's not his given name. And uh, Santino Sayers Gillen. Both ask, do do either of us, but actually I, I'm going to give this to you because it's specific to, to film armorer <laughs> work. Do you have any advice for someone who'd love to become a, a movie armorer as a career, especially in regards to the UK? I know you said you have a you have a, a subsidiary in the UK and there are other yep. prop houses in the UK as well. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I've never been asked that question before. <laughs> by anyone. Well, I was so, going to ask uh, well. So good job, Rambler and Santino. Um, yeah, that's a frequent thing uh, that comes up. And, and I will tell you that, I mean, besides us obviously having a professional relationship, uh, the reason that I agreed to do, you know, Facebook Lives and things like that with, with you guys is because um, I think it's important to elevate the awareness of crew positions like on-set armor. Most people don't even know that that kind of thing exists. Uh, there's no school to go to to learn how to be a motion picture armorer. You can go to film school and they'll teach you all about cameras and lenses and stuff like that, but they're not going to teach you about being an on-set armorer. And so the way that we get new blood and new trainees and new armorers is hopefully by, you know, kind of tickling the, the uh, curiosity of, of people. So um, I would say that, especially in England, because uh, you guys have much less of a firearms culture there than, than we do here in the United States or other places in the world, uh, clearly having former military experience or former law enforcement experience is a good way for you to start. So having worked for the government or, or something like that, because that's really the main way you would have already gotten some background in select fire weapons and military grade equipment and things like that. The other way, um, which I also suggest to people here in California is get into the prop world become a prop person on set. You know, um, the, the prop masters and the prop assistants, th when I go out as an armorer on set as a specialty guy for a day, they're actually on the movie the whole 16 weeks. So when I go out there, I may need an assistant. Hey, Jonathan, come here and help me load these magazines. And after, up. Two, yeah. and after two or three times of going out on the show, and we realize, hey, we're, we're really low on manpower right now. We need to bring someone else into the fold and start training the next generation of armorers. I, I can sit back at the office. We have a meeting and I go, hey, you know what? That Jonathan guy, he was pretty good. I've been out on set with him on a couple different shows. Okay, I'm trying to talk you up here, Jonathan. And if you're, if you're not going to play along, it's very difficult to do. Um, but, you know, I'll say, hey, he's pretty good. Maybe we can give him a little more training. Maybe we can entice him away from the prop world and bring him full time into being an armorer. Uh, clearly, you know, I don't know what the deal is at the armories, right, especially right now. But, you know, clearly working a summer, you know, job as, as an intern at a museum where you get to learn about things that you know, especially in the UK, you won't normally be able to touch on a regular basis. Those kind of things uh, help uh, self-study. I mean, for the longest time myself, I lived in a part of the world where it wasn't easy to get my hands on things sometimes, books and literature and stuff like that. And so self-study on your own, try to find every publication that you can, every article that you can, and, uh, you know, the, the internet is a wonderful tool nowadays 
you know, uh, for that. So, so that's kind of really the, the only real way. You got to get yourself into the movie television business to get your foot in the door. And maybe then you can specialize off into, I like doing wardrobe, I like doing makeup, or I like doing firearms. So all, all good advice. Thanks, yeah. Larry. I'm You're just welcome. Talking, I'm, I'll uh, put my CV in the post. Um, there you go. So, uh, Paul, Paul Whiteflam asks, um, is, is there a film that you haven't worked on that you wish you had? Um, wow, that's, that's a good question. Um, I don't think that there's a film that, that I haven't worked on that I wished I had, but I will tell you that when, when I watch a movie, I think I mentioned this earlier that I don't really like watching movies that I worked on. I already know what's gonna happen. And I was also there, I find it then easier to pick out little mistakes that you as the viewer might not see, but I go, oh man, I remember that night, it was raining all night and nothing worked and all that. So I don't like watching a movie that I worked on, but when I watch a movie that I didn't work on, I do look at it from a professional point of view and I'll, I'll think about things like, how did they film that? I wonder how they set up that particular shot. Clearly, I can pick up the difference between CGI and real gunfire, and I can go, clearly that was real blank ammunition gunfire, yet it looked like they were very close. So how did they play the, the camera angles, the lens angles, and things like that? Um, so that's a little bit interesting to me. Obviously, um, there that you aware of us, which is industry in a time capsule. When, when we make a film, it could take a year and a half before you see it come out in movie theaters. So by the time a movie comes out in the movie theater, I don't even remember whether I worked on that one or not. I'm already working on, I could be working on the third sequel to that one already. So I don't really, you know, sit there and be concerned about one that I didn't work on. By the same token, Independent Studio Services is the largest prop house in the world. And we, without bragging, do the majority of, of big budget projects that you will see out there. And um, Jonathan gave, gave us a very subtle compliment earlier, which I, I'd like to expand on, which is if you stay and read the credits of a film at the end of the film, you start realizing that, oh, okay, I liked this film and that film, and I realize now why, because it was the same people that were working on, the same armor team worked on both films, and you start to, to develop an eye for that. And the reason is, at the higher levels of production that we work at, the number of people that do what we do is very small. Worldwide, it's extremely small. And you should stay and watch the credits at the end of every film, because again, people have missed birthdays and wedding anniversaries and being with their family and have gone through hard, you know, physical hardships and, and things like that because of a dedication of getting the best film done that they could possibly do. And I think it's a, a show of respect to sit through to the end of the film and watch the credits. And if you do that, you can also start recognizing like, oh, that's another film that Jonathan worked on. I've never heard of it, but I think I'm gonna go watch it because I liked the last three that, that he might have worked on, so. I, th I think the only thing my name is on the credits of is um, Sniper Elite 3, the video game. <laughs> but I, again, I was very proud again, of Jonathan, that. Jonathan, it's awfully hard to kind of talk you up like this if every time I do it, you keep, <laughs> you know, you know, you keep Hey, that's that. a great game. <laughs> <laughs> we, we put them through a bit of a boot camp for that. I'll tell you about it one day. I bet you did. <laughs> Uh, so a question from, from Jack Yates. Um, they used to say Clint Eastwood was the only actor who didn't blink when shooting. Uh, who are the most naturally, uh, who are the most natural gunslingers in modern cinema? If you can name anyone. Yeah, I mean, uh, you can go online. It's not like I'm talking out of, out of school here. Um, Clint Eastwood, you know, the majority of his films were very action oriented type films. 
uh, hard to come up with a film that he's in that didn't have a firearm in it. There's only a, a handful that don't have firearms in it. So he was very proficient. Um, again, Tom Cruise is, um, he's very proficient with the firearms, but again, he's an excellent mimic. And he's also very good with everything that he does. You know, if he's riding a motorcycle, he dedicates himself 110% to riding the motorcycle. If he's flying an airplane, he does the same thing. But but again, for me specifically with those firearms skills, that comes across, I think, you know, uh, in, in the films. There's a lot of younger actors that are up and coming that, again, because of that, that cultural thing where we're in this time phase of people being more educated about guns and, and different things like that. Um, so, there's, so there's a lot of them out there. I would say that by and large, the, the rule of thumb is that more of them are good than not good uh, with the firearms. They take it very seriously. It's an element of their craft. If you wanna be an action star, you have to be able to ride a horse, ride a motorcycle, use a firearm. Yep. So um, there's a lot of good ones out there and a lot of even better ones to come that you guys haven't seen yet because the movies just haven't, haven't come out. You know, Bruce Willis is another one. He, he's very, very adept at, at that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, uh, Keanu Reeves is another. Uh, oh, absolutely. I mean, how, how, how could I forget, how could I forget <laughs> that? You know, um, but yeah, I mean, and, any, so many, any of right. the people, any of the people that are professional actors that take pride in their craft and what they're doing, it's going to translate onto screen as looking good. Yeah. And as long as, you know, I mean, yeah, they could have wound up doing some cheap reshoot and having the worst armorer in the industry there who led them astray. But that's very rare that that would happen with the bigger name uh, actors and everything. So. Yeah. Uh, again, it's very, and that's comforting for me as an armor to be able to go out there and go, you know, sometimes they cast an actor the night before, and I don't even know who the act, I know who the character is going to be shooting the gun, but I don't know who the actor is. And mm -hmm. to get out there and go like, oh, okay, it's Tom that's going to be shooting that. It wasn't clear in the script, but it is Tom that's shooting it. I know what his or her skill level is. And so it, you know, gives me confidence when I come up to talk to them to be able to say, you know, I mean, I had a situation uh, a while back on a film I was working and I had to do some actor training with Will Smith. And it's like, Will, I, you know, you're so proficient. I, I feel odd about trying to tell you what to do because your form is so good and, and all that. And of course, he looks great on film when he's doing all of his you know, bad boys movies and, and sci-fi movies and, and things like that. So uh, it's a true pleasure to work with people that are at the top of their game and uh, that, that listen to you also. You know, some, sometimes directors or actors, they might think that they have an uh, image in their mind or they have a vision of a way to do it better. But when you're bought in, it's like, hey, okay, man, you don't need to listen to me, but I've only been doing this for 20 years. And the reason you're paying me is to make sure that you don't make this mistake. But if you don't want to listen to me, as long as it's not unsafe, I'll let you do whatever you want to do because your name's going, you know, on, on the directorial, you know, credit for the film. So it is nice when, when people, you know, they give you that professional respect and they do listen at least to your input. They don't always accept it. But that's fine. At least, you know, you did your part, they did their part, and and hopefully we meet in the middle somewhere. Yeah. Just a couple more, if, if you don't mind. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm, I'm here for you. <laughs> so we've got uh, Marcy Ford is asking... Um, <laughs> uh, if, so you, you, you've, made, you've started appearing on TV, you do Hollywood Weapons... Um, you're, you're kind of you've transitioned somewhat into into the um, well, maybe not acting, but but the TV side of it. Um, if, if you got pursued to to go on Dancing with the Stars, <laughs> would you would would you say yes? <laughs> well, I, I ha I'll tell you two things, Marcy. Um, first of all, anyone that actually knows me 
and has watched me on camera, whether it's on gun stories or Hollywood weapons or, you know, Facebook lives, things like this and everything, will tell you that 100% for sure, I am not an actor. <laughs> and what you're seeing on those shows, it's just me. I, I am the way I am. And they just put the camera in front of me and, and they film it. I'm not trying to act. I'm not trying to play games or anything like that. Um, but as far as dancing goes, I, I, I will tell you, me and my wife will be uh, in January, we'll be celebrating our 32nd wedding anniversary. And going back as far back as our wedding, I did not dance at our wedding. <laughs> and neither did she. So um, I think that dancing with the stars, I'd be happy to be a judge on something <laughs> like that and give some right. commentary or whatever. But the chances of seeing me dance on camera uh, are slim to say the least but thank you for asking i'd say they're in the same ballpark as as mine there you go yeah yeah um what is and, that line on uh uh um that drax uses on the guardians of the galaxy <laughs> movies he goes yeah. there's people that dance and there's people that don't dance <laughs> i don't dance <laughs> yeah i'm afraid i'm i'm one of those people as well um, and we have uh, Nick Jensen Jones uh, asking, how do you educate production designers, producers, directors, other and other crew about firearms to help them get it right? What are the biggest challenges in helping a production team execute their vision? So, and that's an excellent question, Nick. Um, there, there's two different things going on here. One is when you're dealing with a film production. One is when you're dealing with television. As we said, pre-production on a film could be as long as six weeks or 16 weeks. You have time to train people and rehearse and have meetings and all that kind of stuff. A television episode usually gets filmed in six days. So no. your, your training time becomes five minutes on the prop truck going, no, 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 you do it this way, you know, like, like, Something like that. So, so it's two different elements. Um, we talked about armors being actually the people on camera. Uh, frequently on television, let's say you're doing a disassembly scene. It's a war movie. You got an M4 and the, the actor's supposed to take it apart and put it back together because they're in boot camp and they're doing a speed assembly, let's say. Um, and they just they don't have the time to train to make it look slick enough the armorer's hands will be the hands that you're seeing doing that. Um, we like to be in production meetings. If it's a big kind of action-packed shoot 'em up show, the armorer should be involved in every stage of the decision-making. Uh, every time you go out on set, every day before cameras start rolling, uh, we do safety meetings. And we'll bring up and go, okay, people, uh, before lunch, we're going to get this scene and we've got explosions and gunfire. And, and, and we do it, I mean, it's by the beat. This is what's going to happen. When we yell action, that person's going to shoot two shots. Then the camera will make a camera move. This person will then fire five shots and all those kind of things. So we kind of give not just the actors training, but the crew. We make everybody aware of, hey, Mr. Soundman, you can't be standing there because as the actor runs through firing, the ejecting shell cases might hit you in the face. Not even the gun blast, but mm -hmm. the shell casing. So we have to be kind of 360 as far as all of those elements. Um, and again, in Hollywood, you become specialized. Who that does a lot of action movies they kind of stay with action movies. It's rare that they might jump off and do, let's say a romantic comedy. Um, so it is, again, it's a building thing. And, and typically there are some hiccups at the beginning of a production, but by the end of the 16 weeks, everybody knows the drill. Everybody knows the safety parameters. We still have the safety meeting every day or maybe even be before each take, if there's an element that has changed safety wise. Right. But again, that's part of the part of the um, 
on set armor, you got to stand up there in front of 250 crew members and go, okay, everyone, this is my part in the deal tonight. This is what we're going to do. These are the danger elements. This is what I want you to look out for. You know, if, if you're a director and you're on a film set, you let, let's just say you're doing a World War I, you know, movie, and I need a unique firearm from World War I that a lot of them don't exist anymore. So we go to the Royal Armories and Jonathan <laughs> Ferguson comes out as the technical advisor and armorer because my gosh, he knows how to, you know, run this C96 Mauser. He's even written a book about it, you know. And why are you laughing? You did write a book about it and you should be proud of that. Um, <laughs> but but they, they bring this person out and Jonathan's a great guy. But maybe he's kind of a quiet little mousy guy because he's never stood in front of 250 people before. And he's not kind of that proactive guy who's, who's really going to get into it. He's just like, yeah, legally, I need to be here because the gun is in my name. You guys do whatever you want to do. I'll be over there. Call me when you need me. That's the wrong armor for that project. You know what I mean? You, you need... You, and again, that's why every project is different because when you build a crew, you pick the right people to put. Maybe if we're doing a scene where people are walking through a museum and someone's giving a tour, Jonathan should be the tour guide on that film. But when you got Bruce Willis swinging from a chandelier, shooting machine guns and stuff like that, maybe he's not the right guy that time. So uh, that's part of the challenges. It is an educational um endeavor like you you pointed out nick where we we have to bring both the actors the cast and the crew up to speed if we don't feel they're up to speed we go over it again we rehearse it again i never want to have someone injured or work because i didn't emphasize something enough. I mean, yes, movies cost a lot of move money to make. Yes, time is money, but I couldn't care less about the money. Losing some money, yeah, it might bother for me for a day or two, but I'm not going to lose sleep over it. But if someone got hurt because of something I did, I, I, I don't know how I would live with myself. So uh, you have to be a little bit of a teacher, a little bit of a trainer, a little bit of an armor. Uh, in fact, the technical element of running the gun is probably the least important element of what an onset armorer does. Mm. I could, if, if you can drive a car competently, I can teach you to run the gun competently. That's not what's at issue. What's at issue is keeping an eye on the safety elements, being able to transfer your knowledge legibly to an actor or a director, being able to you know, tell an actor or a director no, but yet think quickly on your feet and come up with another alternative. Those are the real challenges. And the good onset armorers are the people that have the right balance between the technical element, the personality element, and, and the diplomatic element. So I don't know what I'm going to do. I, I have none of those <laughs> elements, but I'm still going to keep trying. Well, it, it certainly is a, a particular set of skills, as it were, um, and you, you clearly have them in abundance. So uh, oh, thank, thank you, you. For, thank you for sharing your experiences with us and, and for being so generous with your time. We've, we've, oh, it's we've my really... pleasure. I hope, hope everybody enjoys this stuff. Oh, absolutely. I, I'm sure people are, are loving it. Um, so I guess the last thing to, to ask is with cinema starting to open back up, at least in some places, is there anything that, that you or ISS have worked on that, that you, you're aware of is coming to, to theaters or streaming imminently that people might want to look out for? Um, well, obviously there's certain things because of, of non-disclosure agreements, certain sure. things I'm not allowed to say if they haven't been uh, released yet. Um, I will say that we are in a mode right now of hectishly trying to finish films that got interrupted mm. back in March due to the, to the COVID worldwide pandemic. So we're not necessarily working on a lot of new stuff uh, that might start happening in January. Um, I do recommend if you haven't already seen 
uh, on Netflix, the movie Extraction with oh, Chris Hemsworth. Yes. Please go and watch it. it. It's the first of a new breed of type of streaming platform action type films where it's like, it's like almost something that could, should have been released in a movie theater, but yet it was, you know, created and put on for Netflix. And there are a few others with the same production team that we worked on in series right after Extraction that will be coming out soon. I can't tell you the names. I can't tell you the, the actors or anything, but it's very much in the same vein. And I think you will enjoy uh, those very much. Um, I think once it's safe to go back into a movie theater again, I think we're all excited and waiting for films like Black Widow and Wonder Woman 1984 and, and things uh, like that. And I hope that um, from a worldwide perspective, uh, not just for me because I'm in the industry, but, but from a movie industry perspective, once it's safe to go back into a movie theater, I hope and encourage you to do so. The, the movie experience of being in a movie theater with a hundred other people in the dark, watching a big screen, not, not a little screen television, hearing the surround sound and all that, you know, directors and producers, when they make movies, they have that experience in mind. It's not just a story that they're telling anymore. It's a complete experience. And even with the best home theater setup, you're not going to get that same kind of experience at home that you would get, you know, at a movie theater. And I think too, for like, you know, without sounding too corny, for, for the family unit, uh, for your circle of friends, the, the concept of, oh, it's Friday night, we're all going to meet and go to the movies and have shared experiences together and things like that. That's some of the glue that keeps society together. You know, yeah. when, when things are going good, you can go to the movies and have fun and watch a movie. When things are going bad, except for this current pandemic, Normally, when things are going bad, you can run away to the movies and forget your troubles and all that. So it's not just, hey, we're making a product in Hollywood and we want you to spend money on it, you know, so that I can put my kid through college. But it's, it is a creative art form. And, and I hope that we get to a point, uh, it might not be in the near future, it might be a little bit more in the distant future, but... I hope we get to the point where it is safe to actually go back and watch a movie in the movie theater. And then I hope the viewing public is willing to go back and do it and recognize the uh, special experience that, that that is watching a film in, in, a, in a movie theater. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> needless to say, I, I agree with all of that. The, the recommendation of Extraction is, yeah, absolutely brilliant. Really enjoyed that film. Um, and I'm excited to see what, follows that yep. um, in terms of going back to the cinema as well yeah I, I totally totally agree with you obviously everyone else has their own threshold for, for what they feel is safe and appropriate and all of that but I think the first thing my wife and I did when it was possible to do so here in the UK was to go back and, and see a film uh, we Excellent. Went, went to see a, a, and I'll tell you as well if you if you go online you can read the articles and back this up Tom Cruise is someone who you know, clearly is a very wealthy individual. And if he didn't want to work, maybe didn't have to work or didn't have to expose himself to dangers, you know, or, or dangerous situations, he has recently gone out and made a point of putting on a mask and going to a crowded movie theater and watching uh, Christopher Nolan's latest movie, Tenant, because of his belief in that movie going experience and and saying, see, I'm willing to do this too. You people should come and do this as well. I can't, in California, I can't do that right now. Sure. Uh, other states, other countries around the world are slowly uh, beginning to get back to that. Um, and it's, it's, you know, like, like I said, I had been out on set for three days since I came back from the pandemic. And I took it very seriously because I felt as someone in the industry, it's my responsibility to try to get the ball rolling 
to get production back, you know, up and running again. If everybody goes, and eh, no, I'll wait another month, another year, I'll let someone else go to the movie theater, you know, and then when I think it's really, really safe, then I'll go back. You may not have a movie theater to go back to. And I think that would be a huge loss um, for the artistic community, for the viewing community, not to mention to the 